Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon where you are. This is Liz Albro here, the Commissioner for the National Center for Education Research, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to our annual PI meeting. Um, the theme this year is building on 20 years of IES research to accelerate the education sciences. And I know that many of you have been on this journey with us for at least a good portion of those 20 years. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of my thoughts for this PI meeting. So first, let us thank our great co-chairs, Roddy Theobald and Un Su Cho, who have worked really hard behind the scenes and with my team and with the Nixer staff to bring cheap for you this great meeting that we're about to enter and have fun with. Um, I think I would also love to thank my team at NCER. Sometimes I have pictures of everyone up, but I decided I would do names for folks in case everyone doesn't know everyone here. I wanted to especially thank Christina Chin and Helen Kim, who have been driving this train to make sure that we have a high quality PI meeting. And I'm immensely grateful for all the work that they're doing to make sure that we can all be together in this virtual space. I want to thank my two associate commissioners, Laura Namey and Alan Ruby, who keep me sane and who work really closely with our staff uh, and really keep NCR running smoothly. And thanks to every single person who is named on this slide, without whom we wouldn't have a center and you wouldn't have any program officers. So thanks team for all you do to make the good work that we're going to talk about today and over the next couple of days happen. As always, I like to start with a funding overview and some highlights of what's been going on over the past year or so since we were last together. So as you know, fiscal 22 was a little bit of an unusual year for us. Not only were we in a position where we had more awards than we had funds available or more applications rather than funds available for our 305A competition, we also had the opportunity to make awards using American Rescue Plan funds. The asterisks that you see along the bottom line there um, indicate that those were competitions that were funded by the American Rescue Plan that, our, that Congress gave to us and to many of our colleagues across government to try to make sure that we are addressing the key critical needs of our nation as we emerge out of this period of the pandemic. As you can see, even given those, well, both the constraints and the, the wonderfulness of the ARP money, I think we've had a pretty good and robust year. We have a deep investment uh, across a wide portfolio of work, and we were able to fund many, if not all, of the, of the awards that we had hoped and intended to, to award. I will say, and I think uh, some of you know this, that as our fiscal 23 appropriations uh, came to us, it looks like we are gonna have the opportunity to fund down the slate a little bit further than we have been able to, given that we, given the amount of money that we've received. So happy to talk more about that uh, in the Q&A later, but I just wanted to flag that for folks who um, are on that bubble and I know have been waiting. So let's just talk through some of the highlights. I'm gonna talk uh, uh, today about some of the American Rescue Plan funded networks as I think they're some of our most exciting work. They're timely, they're attentive to the needs of our communities right now, and they're really helping us chart the path forward for our work and your work as we think together about how to make sure that our students and learners who've been really negatively impacted by the pandemic can have the opportunity to, to rebound and grow. So got th the three networks are, are listed here. Leveraging evidence to accelerate recovery nationwide. Uh, the LEARN network is our network where we're trying to uh, help think about how can we be better able to scale work that uh, scale interventions that work programs and practices more quickly. So we have a network where we have a lead that's going to be providing guidance to all of us on the on sort of as part of this community to scale the work that we're doing that has high quality evidence behind it. And we've got some test cases, right? Some teams that are going to be trying out some of these practices as they prepare to scale their work. The two other networks that are described here, the Pre-K-12 Restart Network and the Accelerating Recovery and Community College Network are specifically intended to meet and assess the needs of our communities who are, who are um, 
implementing plans, right, to try to recover from some of the learning loss that has occurred, or the learning inequities that we see, the learning, uh, the disproportionality and opportunities that we see across the nation. And you all should stay tuned. We're excited. They're just getting off the ground, all three networks. And I think there's going to be lots of exciting and interesting findings for us to learn from. I think the other thing that's really uh, exciting for us is that our Using Longitudinal Data Program, which encourages the research community to partner with our SLDS community, was focused precisely and specifically on meeting state recovery needs this time through. We were glad to be able to fund three projects looking at some of the actions and activities that states are putting in place to try to address the needs of their communities. So we're looking at school extension programs in North Carolina. We're looking at how to re-engage young adults who were disrupted in their educational pathways through Tennessee. And we're looking at, again, additional time in the context of Texas. So stay tuned. We're really excited because some of our earlier projects that were funded at the beginning of the pandemic, specifically in Virginia and Pennsylvania, are starting to share out their findings and what they've been learning. And we're looking forward to learning from these projects as well as we continue to try to figure out how best to attend to the needs of all of our communities across the nation. All right. It's 20 years, right? The theme of the of the meeting is really focused on building on the past 20 years and thinking about the future. So I figured it would be nice to do like a lightning uh, summary of 20 years in two slides. So just for context, when we started, we ran really three competitions on the left. We have five, five there on the left, but the reality is, is that the interagency Education Research Initiative and scale-up evaluations were, if you will, kind of pre-baked in the OERI frame. They had already been happen had happened and launched, but cognition and student learning, the research, uh, the program of research on reading comprehension, and the preschool curriculum evaluation research project were three of our initial, the three sort of big initial investments. But as you can see, when we started in 2002, we only made 23 awards, not inclusive of SBIR. I must say SBIR was, was there and, and has been ongoing throughout. Um, and now in 2022, we have invested or we so far have invested in 87 projects and who are valued at almost $164 million. We're at a different place than we were 20 years ago, which is wonderful and exciting. Um, and I'm glad that you all have been part of this journey. Just a second. What does our cumulative investment look like? So when I look across everything that we have funded, we see that NCER has supported nearly 2,000 projects for a total amount of $3.3 billion. It's not small dollars, right? I mean, it's a lot of work and it's really exciting when you look at these top level categories to see how our investments have been distributed across the different kinds of work that we support. I wanna do a shout out and a call out to the research training investments that we have done um, and focused on for so many years as I feel like they have been critical to building capacity and transforming the work that we do um, in the education sciences. So what have we learned as we've gone through these past, these past 20 years? I think um, Matt Soldner and I uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about this theory of action and thinking about how the IES theory of action sort of intersects and works across all of IES and honestly how it intersects with the work of evidence building in the department. And I know some of you have seen versions of this slide before, but I have been finding it very helpful to reflect on as we think about how we can leverage the expertise and the different kinds of expertise that we have across IES to make sure that the work that we're supporting is impactful and is being available to the folks who need it um, when the time is right. So the slide has my arrows across the center of the screen and those arrows as any of you as all of you on the phone know don't really represent necessarily reality on the ground right there's usually lots of cycling back there's lots of iteration as we're learning from one another but the idea here is that first you need to understand the problem then you need to understand um sort of the develop you need to develop interventions and measures so that you can be ready to test whether these things are actually working 
um, as you thought they were going to work. And then as, as we get evidence of uh, causal impact, that we can then look at questions of replication and effectiveness. And then when we have this body of knowledge that's generated, we can synthesize what we've been learning and try to mobilize it across our nation. We've highlighted here the centers that have the primary responsibility for these different aspects of the research trajectory, but it's a little bit deceptive to be honest because describing conditions on the ground is not only the responsibility of NCES. Many of you, particularly those of you who are doing um, work under the exploratory project type are doing precisely that, right? You're describing what's happening. You're generating hypotheses about what might be going on and using that to make determinations about what the next step in the scientific inquiry that you wanna do should be. Um, similarly, on the other end of the continuum here, research synthesis and research mobilization are responsibilities for, for all of our centers, right? Um, NCE clearly has formal structures for synthesis. You all are familiar with the WellWorks Clearinghouse. You're familiar with the practice guides. But I will say that we are noticing and seeing that knowledge synthesis is something that our grantees are doing and are, they're doing more of. And we are hopeful that we'll be able to incentivize even more of that going forward. Um, when we think about knowledge mobilization, knowledge use, we think a lot about the role of the regional educational laboratories, the What Works Clearinghouse, and ERIC, who are all critical pieces of both understanding how to share what we're learning, how to make sure we're meeting the needs of our learners, um, and sort of feeding back into our knowledge generation, right? The work that we as the research community are responsible for, making sure that we have this ever going uh, cycle where we're learning from one another and really trying to address the problems of learners across the nation. I think the other reason, the other thing that's really been fun and exciting and that we've learned a lot about over the past 20 years is the, the different and important roles that our R&D centers and our research networks can play in this entire process, right? So many of you have been part of or are currently part of R&D centers and or research networks. And one of the exciting and fun things about these different models is that you can be carrying out multiple kinds of research at the same time, have multiple teams working together to try to build the knowledge that we need. So from our perspective, we feel like this model, this theory of action that we use to think about how do we build evidence both within IES and within the department, we feel like it's working. It's helping us accumulate knowledge, which is in fact one of our key missions. So just a high level summary of what we are doing. If I had more time, I would go through examples of each of these, but I just wanna talk at a high level because I really do wanna make sure that we have time for conversation after my formal remarks are done. So what are we doing here in the National Center for Education Research? We are, you are helping us build evidence. You are developing high quality tools and resources that support this evidence building that we're doing. You're developing high quality assessments and measures about without which none of this work could happen. You are expanding and building capacity in the education sciences workforce. Last time I counted, uh, NCER, actually it's probably NCR and NICSER together, have supported more than 2,200 individuals in our research training programs. Given that our community is not super large, I think that that's a very impressive number. And I know that many of you who are participating in our meeting today have been able to be part of that capacity building as instructors, as learners, and we're so happy that you are and look forward to being able to continue to offer training opportunities for individuals from the undergraduate, um, in the undergraduate space, all the way up through investigators who are currently and active in the field. I think the other thing that's been happening that we've been, as I was reflecting on this, is that we've been supporting collaborations in a lot of different ways. We've tried many different models over the years. Uh, some of these models have been very explicit, right? We can think of the Research Practice Partnership Program. Uh, we can think of the using longitudinal data program that currently exists. But I think one of the things that strikes me as I think through about this collaborative process, um, and particularly as I think about what we've learned from COVID, is that many of you are deeply, deeply committed to the communities with whom you are working, and that what you have been focused on during the, this pandemic period has really been 
trying to be of service to the communities that you are working with to carry out your research. And I know that you all have many stories that you could share about how you were able to bring your knowledge and your expertise just and just your time, right, and your resources to help these communities without whom none of the work that we do here could have happened. I think we're also doing a pretty good job sharing what we are learning broadly. As you all know, this is a charge that we have, and you all can probably predict what's going to come on the next slide, um, but we are pleased, I am pleased as commissioner, seeing how much of our work is being picked up and shared and how, how um, engaged all of you all are in, in that sharing. So open science and public access is a big piece of the work that we are doing in terms of sharing what we're learning. I want to give a little teaser here because there's going to be a, a longer session on this later in the meeting. But I'm really, really happy to see the increasing numbers of grantee publications that are being uploaded to ERIC. Um, as you can see, if we go back to 2014, so um, Two years after the policy was initially established, we have so far 2,668 grantee submissions. Thank you all for all the work that you have done to make that happen. Um, and we have uh, more than 2,000 full text articles available for free to the public to learn from. Um, we see that lag uh, in the 2022 uh, document because full text um, full text is not yet available, right, due to embargo periods, but teaser that will be changing in the future. And so we're, we're really looking forward to talking with you about how we're thinking about making some of those changes. Data, sharing data is another big piece of this, right? Not only to support replication and reproducibility, but also so that we could think about ways to pull the data together to answer new and interesting questions. One of the things I've been trying to do is figure out where all this data is being stored, right? We know a whole lot of you have data management plans you're required to share. And I will say that it's really challenging to figure out where data lives. Um, from what I was able to find, there are 42 data sets in ICPSR and the Open Science Framework holds 25 that I was able to find. But one of the things I would love your input and thoughts about are how can we as IES help uh, do a better job at making sure that people can find the data so that they can pull it together and use it in their future work. So here's my teaser. Join us um, at 1 p.m. on Thursday uh, for a continued conversation about open science and what's coming next and what we're currently thinking about uh, in relationship to that. What about the future? I know that whenever folks come to the PI meeting, they're hoping that I can tell them all about what the funding picture is going to look like and what's going to be available. Um, and as is often true, I can say some things, but I can't say everything that you all want me to say at this point. But here's what I can say. So what are we doing right now, right? What are people doing? We are making 23 awards for the competitions that we ran. We are working hard on getting our, our lineup, if you will, of 24 competitions uh, completed and shared and on the street. And, and hopefully we will have things to, to talk about in the Q&A that uh, will be useful and exciting for you guys. We focused a lot on transparency and trying to figure out how we can improve, uh, making sure that you all have the opportunity to know what it is that we have been doing and providing opportunities for y'all to give us input. As is true for all of us across government, we are focused on equity and figuring out how to, how to more explicitly call out our investment and interest in equity. Um, and we're focused as we have been again for at least the past decade, if not longer in broadening participation. So just some highlights here. In our 23 competitions, you all can read this, but we're super excited um, to be able to share the IES NSF AI Institutes. I can't say anything right now when I'm recording this, but I will be able to share in, in May who, uh, who we have jointly funded. We're excited about the, our methods training awards in data science that are coming up, as well as our early career mentoring awards for faculty at MSIs, our new 305S awards. We're gonna be having some research teams join the CIRNET to see if this, the promise of digital learning platforms can actually um, be exhibited and we will have a network lead for our next generation CTE research network. 
in 24, we're thinking about a lot, a lot of things, but I did want to just flag for folks who haven't necessarily been paying attention, not that that's not true, um, but in our 23 appropriations, we were charged with carrying out um, and launching research programs that are aligned with NCAID uh, or sort of the next version of ARPA-ED, right? So uh, the Hill is really excited in terms of thinking about how the ARPA model could extend to the work of ED. And NCER has been charged with establishing new programs of work to look at, high, to carry out high-risk, high-reward, scalable, and transformative research. Um, Ezra reauthorization is on the horizon again. So for those of you who pay attention to policy, just want you to know that that's happening. Um, and I want to just say that we're really engaged with this very interesting, interesting point where there's lots of intentional communication and conversations across IES, uh, particularly around how do we support high quality knowledge synthesis and knowledge use across all of the centers. And I know y'all want a list of competitions, but I don't have those yet, so I can't share them. Um, transparency, trying to figure out the best way to share uh, information about who's participating in our work has been an ongoing challenge and an ongoing commitment that we've had. I will say that we're excited because we're in the middle of a digital modernization process and there should be a new website in the not too distant future, which will make some of this easier. We are working on compiling data for our 21 and 22 applicants and awardees. Given that um, we haven't finished making, we hope, we hope, fingers crossed, all of our 22 awards, we're um, holding that data until that information is complete. And we're also working hard with our disclosure review board to make sure that whatever we put up on the website doesn't violate uh, privacy, right? Which is always a concern for us. We've added information about individuals, um, which individuals completed our pre and postdoctoral training programs. If you haven't visited the abstracts later, I invite you to, uh, recently, I invite you to do so. Um, we're really excited. We've awarded a contract to help us think through what are these indicators of success that we should be thinking about as success for our collective training programs. We're We've got we've been working through the deliverables on this, and we're super excited to to work together with our contractor to develop a plan to collect and report available data. Again, more than 2,000 individuals. Our, my team is pretty strapped, so we're really thrilled to have folks here to help us as we develop this plan. Um, and I think some of you participated in a survey that we sent out recently, trying to understand what grantees are currently collecting about the study samples, right? But what do you routinely collect? We're trying to get that information so that we can think about what is a reasonable request of you all in terms of in your APR and final reports uh, to give us back information about who is participating in your studies so that we can be intentional about describing who's participating in our work. We're also trying to be more intentional about receiving input from the field. I hope that many of you saw the request for information that um, I posted uh, back in February, seeking for public input on the foci of our future fiscal 24 R&D centers. We are required to have that competition. It will be happening. And we are uh, reading carefully through all of the comments that we received. And I intend to be sharing out a letter from the commissioner that'll talk about how I'm going to use that information and we're going to think together about how to make decisions about which topics to compete. Um, and my our sister center, Nixer, uh, recently hosted a technical working group on the special education teacher workforce um, as they're trying to think about what their next set of investments should be in that space. Equity continues to be a, a concern, a driver, something that we're thinking intentionally about. I hope that all of you all are aware that we now have a SEER equity principle. We have a set of principles and our what we're working on right now is developing, pulling together tools and resources that can help all of us as a research community as we're thinking about addressing equities, equity and inequities um, in, the, in the carrying out of our own research. So we held a technical working group. That summary will be up very soon and we will be planning next steps in terms of tools and resources that we can share out with the community. Um, and as our RFAs come out, you all will have a chance to see how we have been thinking about equity across our portfolio of investments. Broadening participation, again, this is something that we're, that we're deeply committed to and are excited about. 
Um, as you all know, we launched our early career mentoring for faculty at MSIs. We intend to continue a competition. We intend to continue to compete that um, and are hoping to increase the number of applications that we receive. So please, when it comes out, I, I ask you to share that with your colleagues across government, I mean, not government, uh, sorry, um, across the university sector uh, who are working at MSIs who might be good individuals to participate in this program. Um, and we're also, again, we awarded a small contract to help us learn from our colleagues across government. Many of our colleagues across government have entire offices devoted to, to questions of broadening participation. And we, of course, don't have those resources. So we're trying to identify what are the things that we can do given the resources that we have available. Stay tuned, more to come on that. And that is where I want to end. So we're going to switch over to our q and I'm really looking forward to having a chance to share uh, what's happening at IES right now and to uh, hear from you all. So thanks very much for everything. And I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Have a great meeting. Go ahead. If you have questions after listening to my remarks, uh, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A so that we can, um, I can start answering them as quickly as I can. I'm um, excited to see you guys. I wish we were all together in person. talking to myself. Um, so questions are coming in and uh, I'm going to answer Aaron Lyons question first because I know that he um, he and everyone else wants to know, right? Um, is the plan to be in person next year? That is currently the assumption, but of course, as is true for all things in government, one never knows what might happen. But that is we are we are working toward uh, being together and in person. So more to come on that. Um, all right. <laughs> People are asking questions about the new RFAs and I will tell you, uh, yes, this is always the question. Sorry, I'm kind of waiting on these because I know people are gonna come in. I have another question here about, uh, from Russell Almond who says he's preparing a data set from his recently, first of all, hi everybody. I just jumped right into saying questions. It's so nice to, to see you. Please put lots of questions in. Um, as always, feel free to ask uh, questions to me. I think once we're done with these webinar style kinds of conversations, we'll actually be able to see each other and have different com and have conversations where it'll feel more like we are live and in person. Um, so I hope my remarks were helpful. I, I you know, they were prepared about a, a month and a half ago. So uh, things have changed and I will do everything I can to answer the questions that I can. Okay, so having said that, Russell, you are asking, he says, I, I'm preparing a data set from my recently finished study for sharing. Are there standards or recommendations about documenting the data, particularly the meaning and values of the data columns? Um, Russell, so I am actually gonna punt that question, not because it's not an important one, but I wanna encourage you to join our open science session that Laura Namie and I will be leading um, and of course, I'm realizing I don't know exactly the date. It's on Thursday, uh, but it's in the calendar, and we will talk some more about that. I will, um, we will refer you, and we are working on new versions of our open science uh, plan. And one of the things we are going to be trying to do is provide additional information about data sets um, and how to prepare them. I think the other, the other resource I'd refer you all to is the information on data preparation that's available on this year's standard page. So there is that. All right, have we stabilized? It looks like our numbers are sort of slow. So people wanna know about specifics about the RFAs and what is happening. Um, so here's the question about the RFAs. So we are in the middle of getting our RFAs in line and there will be federal register notices coming out. 
Uh, we anticipate having a, a broad range of competitions, including ones that are both familiar and ones that will look new. Um, so you will, I think that um, if you look in the Federal Register Notice, you'll see, I mean, not the Federal Register Notice, the Congressional Justification, we included some language uh, telegraphing that we do anticipate holding our education research grants competition. We do anticipate holding our training program competition. Um, we have to compete R&D centers, as you all know, um, with RFI. I'm currently working through the 500 pages worth of feedback that we received. So lots of research questions that need to happen. I know Mark talked about T, which we are required to do in response to direction um, in our appropriations language. And uh, I think the only other thing that I uh, mentioned in the congressional justification is our 305S, um, the using data to uh, the using state longitudinal data systems to answer key questions. So the answer is that that uh, that's sort of what the competitions look like right now. Um, we will be posting federal register notices soon. I really had hoped that we would have one out prior to the PI meeting. We are actively working on it right now. So there will be additional information coming soon. So please make sure you're paying attention to the FRNs and that you're signed up for Twitter and for our newsflash and you will hear as soon as there's information, more detailed information that we can share. Um, but I, we, will, we will be having a robust competition season. So start to get your ideas in line and start to reach out to POs and, and start to think about what are the, comp what are the applications you wanna put in uh, this time around. Um, okay, let me go back and I'm sorry, looking, trying to go from the beginning. Um, Sonia, you asked about, Sonia Cabell asked about uh, timelines. Our timelines are going to be, some of them will be quite familiar. The stuff, RFAs will be coming out over the next probably month and a half or so with due dates in uh, late August, early September. There will also be some, uh, some competitions that are gonna be shifted where we have uh, announcements coming out later in the summer with applications due in the fall. So it's kind of a schedule we've been following with our competitions over the past several years. So please stay tuned. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot coming down the pike. I, I'm hopeful. Um, all right, so Funding levels, I'm not gonna go into any details on funding levels. I will simply say that um, unlike in prior years, we do have um, enough funds to run a good, uh, a good robust competition season. I will say that we do have some uh, direction from, uh, from the Congress about how we have to spend some of that money uh, in relationship to NCAID-like activities. So that is being taken into consideration as we're building out our plans. Um, in terms of the NASM, I have a couple of questions related to the NASM report. Um, we have been thinking long and hard about the recommendations that were received and um, are taking that into consideration as part of our plans. As you all know, we're, since we're in the middle of all of that, um, it's challenging for me to say anything specific right now. I will say that one of the things um, that I did talk about were our two, the two, um, uh, sort of initial contracts that we launched, trying to get wrap our heads around what we can do productively and proactively around broadening participation along multiple dimensions of the work that we support, as well as trying to get everything together that we need in order to have an accurate um, description of individuals who've gone through our research program, our research training programs and what they're doing. Um, so we have received some initial reports from those folks and we'll be sharing, um, I will be sharing my reflections on what we've learned and what our next steps are um, as soon as I get RFAs out. Um, so there is that. I think we certainly, you know, there were a lot of recommendations that were included in there. I think the only other thing I'd like to share about the NASA report is as we've been thinking internally about how to Think about the future of education research. We have really been thinking collectively about this and not only about NCER, but how this works in the constellation of NCER, NCE, and NCSER because of our different missions and mandates. And so we've been trying to think together about how, um, how the recommendations can help us, if you will, build out our ecosystem more intentionally and more explicitly. Thank you, Laura, for putting in that. Um, so the report, so Martha, just to be clear, the, the group that is um, evaluating outcomes for the training programs right now, they're not actually preparing, um, I don't believe, and um, 
if my if Meredith or anyone is here is correct me, they are currently preparing the data for us. I don't know that a deliverable is a report, but we will be working on that very soon. Um, so uh, we will let you know as soon as there's more to say. Uh, the summary for the listening sessions, Dore asked about, is there an update on when the summary from the listening sessions with the scholars from underrepresented groups will come out? Um, we are working on that. Uh, it is ongoing. Um, as you guys know, our staff is stretched pretty thin and we have been actually having a set of interns working with us on the listening sessions. And so it is coming soon, Dory. You didn't miss it. We will be sure to share it uh, when we have that. Uh, David Kaplan is asking about, do I anticipate any changes to the funding or focus of the stats and modeling panel, the stats and methods panel? I can't speak to that, but I can say we do have a new staff member, several new staff members, um, and Charles Lauren is our new Stats and Methods Program Officer, so I know that we will be working with him as we think about what the next iteration of the competition um, will, will be. Um, methods Training and Data Science, Kristen Daler, Daler, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, it's Kirsten. Daler, I'm looking at this, I can slow down and read in front of me. Um, so Kirsten, the methods training and data science competition was a focus that we had in our fiscal 23 competition. And we are getting ready to announce the awards that we made in uh, under that competition. We anticipate um, in our training competitions for this year that it will be an open, an open methods training competition as opposed to a narrowly focused one. The narrow focus was done intentionally because we were really concerned about available funds for fiscal 23. Um, so, so the, okay, I hope that answered your question, but please keep asking questions if you have more. Um, so yeah, so Fiona Hollins asks, any thoughts on how IES can do, can reflect, you know, sort of re respond to Mark's uh, challenge to change what people think is possible? I think that's a really interesting uh, question. And it was just posed to us yesterday in a meeting that we were having as we're starting to think about how to stand up this new function within NCER. I do, I do think that part of this has to do with what, what we think of as transformative. What is transformative, right? What does that actually mean? And I, I don't have any specifics because I really, I think part of what we want to think about is let's just get outside of the box and think about what can happen. I actually think Kay Wijikumar's uh, presentation in the opening plenary was provocative around that where she talked about how her full body of work really said, look, this is what we can do. But what one of the messages I took home from that is that there's so much that we need to do in order to think about changing the what is possible. Um, I'm happy. I wish we could have an open conversation about this because I'd really love to hear from you all in terms of what you are thinking um, and what the research community can be thinking about how to break open that box and to think about what is possible. All right. I can't, that, those can't possibly be all the questions that people have. And I've talked really fast about things. Nope. All right, I've got something in the chat. Let me just see. Sorry, it's very, I'm just see a blank screen. Um, so just a reminder that if you all have questions to please type them into the Q&A, given that this is, this is a webinar, so we don't actually have the opportunity to um, turn speakers on. Oh, okay. Mark talked about the importance of applied research and then what? Okay, Holly, you're gonna tell me what the next part of the question is. <laughs> I think applied research is an interest, it's a construct that we've thought about for the 20 years that I've been here, right? I think that applied research is a big part of what we do. And we're really trying to think about how do we take everything that we have learned over the past 20 years and of course, much beyond that, all of the work that's happened before and make sure that what we are learning um, gets uh, is both responsive to the needs of the practitioners um, and making sure that folks have access to the findings um, about blogs and journal articles. So Holly, I think dissemination, you're right. Dissemination is a big, big piece of this. Um, so I, I believe that the, um, 
thinking carefully about who our audiences are and how to get out to them would be is really, really important. I will say we've been working closely with our comm support and that's really helping us think about um, think about the ways in which we can disseminate our findings, right? So if you fall if you're following us on LinkedIn, or in Twitter, um, you will see that we've been working really, really hard to share out blogs that are written from the IES research blog space and sharing that out. And I think that that for those of you who are on social media, thinking about strategic ways to share your findings into the broader community would be really important and helpful to think through. Um, okay, let me just see. Kent, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I'm hoping that your program officer can respond, but I'm happy to follow up and figure out what's going on in terms of that. Um, Fiona, logistics question. I think the Zoom chat feature is disabled here because it's a webinar format. It will not be, it will not be disabled in the future sessions. Um, Kristen, the transformative research in the education sciences competition, um, I'm glad you thought it was a great idea. We are gonna be having a new version of that that will be competed um, the, this year. Little was funded, but that was intentional. So I just wanna remind folks that when we structured the transformative research in the education sciences competition, it had a different, we had a different way of making decisions. So individuals had to reach a certain threshold of significance as well as an overall score. And so we, because this was meant to be um, risky, we intentionally funded a small number of projects. We are um, curious to see what happens with the new framework and the new way in which we're reimagining it. But I'm glad that you liked it. And I hope that folks um, are already putting their thinking hats on and thinking about what kinds of transformative work they might want to be submitting for consideration. Um, okay. Oh, you can only see your own questions. All right. Well, I'll try to read these out then, Fiona. Thank you for giving me the heads up. Um, the LEARN Network. Uh, so Mary Brash Hines says, the LEARN Network that you mentioned has important foci on creating a minimum, vi minimum viable products, understanding the marketability of our developed education products, and collecting performance, rel reliability, cost, and convenience data. Will these emphases start to be integrated into IES RFA requirements? I think, Mary, there is certainly absolutely an intent for us to begin to think about how do we build in what we're learning from um, the Learn Network and from scaling into uh, many of our competitions going forward, right? So one of the things as we're learning about scaling is that it's often hard to retrofit something that, that has already been developed without taking into consideration some of these, uh, some, these factors early on as you're developing and beginning to make sure that your products assuming they have the effects that we intend for them to have, are ready to go out and be scaled broadly. Um, okay, and then we have, uh, all right, and I'm realizing I'm over my time here. Um, we have uh, someone who says that he or she is still puzzling over the push and pull of local support we provide to education providers versus generalizable tools, such as what Kay presented, um, as well as the push and pull of large ed tech providers and researcher generated solutions and how we reach, transform and sustain growth in educational setting. What are my thoughts? Many thoughts. I think the push and pull is always gonna be real. Right. I think that that is part of what makes working in this space so exciting and also so, so challenging. I'm I am hopeful that when we think about the development work and developing products that we're developing, that we're thinking about an ecosystem of supports where we can be responsive to the needs of our local communities, but also providing tools that are that have high quality evidence that are generalizable that could potentially be adapted right for use in um, in the local context as we're moving forward with that. Um, I think the large ed tech providers, this is a big question, right? And one of the things that if you, as, if you look at the NEED Act, for those of you who have not yet done so, because I know you guys like to read legislation on the weekends, right? That's your favorite activity. Um, I think that this challenge of thinking about how do we make sure that the research that you all are doing is part of the conversation that's happening um, with the ed tech developers, curriculum developers, all of these indiv individuals and companies that are directly engaged with our education providers. This is a challenge that we're hoping we can address with some of this additional funding and additional investment uh, that, that potentially will be part of our portfolio of work going forward through uh, NCAID. 
All right, guys, this was not nearly so I couldn't see anybody's faces. Um, hi, John. <laughs> um, and so as you guys know, I do like to see people's faces, but I am also mindful of the fact that uh, people might need a break. We've been on Zoom since about 11, 1130. So I want to make sure that everyone has their 30 minutes. I will be in and out of sessions um, and uh, look forward to hearing questions and, and participating in, in actual conversations where we can see everybody. Um, I want to just do a quick shout out again to Christina and Helen Kim, as well as our colleagues at Nixer, who have been essential in making this happen. Uh, thank you for your patience with the glitches as we were getting things going. I think everything should be smooth, but you all should have the tech help if you need help. And always feel free to reach out directly to me if there's anything I can do to help and support and assist. And please send your thoughts, send your questions. I really would love to hear from you all as we're building out the next 20 years. We have lots of input that we're taking into consideration, and I'm always grateful for the thoughts that you guys provide and all the great work you do. And with that, go get a lunch or a coffee or whatever it is, depending upon where you are. And uh, we will see you at the next session, which will start at 2.25. So thanks, everybody. Talk to you all soon.